Hello world, welcome back. <laughs> I'm Christina, and today I have a lovely guest on the program, uh, and her name is Ashton, and we went to college together, and how cool is that? And look at us now. <laughs> so, we're 3,000 miles apart, but in the same industry. Yeah, uh, I think that's a pretty cool thing. So we both went to Holland University in Roanoke, Virginia, and I studied dance. And did you technically study film at Holland? I did study film at Holland. Like I went, my first undergrad was Mary Baldwin and mm. I found my love for film there, but they didn't have a film major. They only had communications. Mm. So I, try, I looked at other film schools in the state and Holland was one of them that popped up. So I went to Holland, plus it was in like literally where I grew up. So it was kind of a catch like a plus plus because my mom would pick up my laundry on Friday and go home and do it. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta take advantage of the system. That's what it's all yeah. about. <laughs> we well, didn't have free laundry at the time. We didn't have free laundry until our last year. Wow, that's really true. I forgot about that. What a, a life lesson that really taught us from an early age. <laughs> Nothing's free. Yeah, nothing's um, free. But speaking of nothing is free, do you want to tell the folks at home how you then got into the film industry outside of school? Um, I got, well, I kind of always, I mean, my early start was like, I found photography when I was in high school. And then I went to, by happenstance, ended up at Mary Baldwin and had an amazing film teacher and saw my first film that really caught my eye, which is Chinatown by Roman Polanski. I know he has a bad rap, but that movie is like, it's, it, like, it's still had a whole, it's like in my top five. Yeah. Um, it's a special place in my heart. But like, then I came out to LA and went into grad school because I didn't feel like I had the network at Holland's to make it into onto a film set. And I didn't have the money to make it onto a film set, like, and move out to LA. Like, LA is expensive. Um, so what I did is I took on a lot of student film debt and went to USC. Um, I graduated from USC four years ago now, 2016, 2020. Yeah, four years ago. God, I'm old. Um, so I've been living out here doing freelance ever since. So the network that I got at USC to answer your question is how I ended up on film sets. That and I used... I know a lot of people aren't for them, but I used a lot of job boards, like uh, Mandy and all that stuff, to in order to Facebook to find things, and now it's mostly word of mouth. That's awesome. I mean, I feel like some people that aren't familiar with the film industry see it as like there's such a huge gap. Like, how do you, you watch this amazing movie and how could you possibly be on those sets? So everyone kind of has a different story and just wanted to share yours. Yeah, no, I agree. Like, I feel like there's some, a lot of people ask me because they find out that I went to USC and I did not know this when I applied to USC because I only applied to five schools when I was at Holland for grad school, which was Tisch, UCLA, Cal Arts, USC, I feel like there was a fifth one, if not, I don't know. But like I got into USC and I went to USC and it wasn't until like the second day of orientation that they were like, yeah, it's the number one film school in the world. I was like, what? <laughs> I was like, okay, cool. Um, yeah, I'm here with a lot of them bet. Um, but yeah, I'm here. And that's how I got my network. It also helped me, it, I thought I wanted to direct when I went to USC. Hmm. Like, and that's how, it's through USC that I figured out I wanted to do some stuff. Oh, that's pretty cool. Was it certain programs or the teachers there that sort of shifted that for you? Um, I think a lot of it was like I was looking at my immediate immediate ten year plan and I was like, directing costs money. Like if you want to get stuff made, like you have to have money to make it, like to pay for it, to pay for your set dressing, to pay for your equipment, like all of this. And I was like, I don't have that. I'm like, I need to make money. I need to make money to live out here. Um, so I was like, what can I do? that makes money. I was like, this is in photography. And then there's so many things underneath cinematography that you can learn in a position that also makes money. And my skill set typically leans more towards camera. 
So I went into camera department and have worked my way up through that. So that's my money maker and then mostly branching over into some photography. Would you say your cinematography has a certain aesthetic right now, or would you say that the the projects you've been on have been very much independent pieces that you're just helping with those visions? Um, I think I think mostly for that part, like I think I don't necessarily have like this like like you look at Roger Deakins, he has a very distinct look to his work, right? I don't think I necessarily have developed a distinct look yet, which I'm happy with because I don't want to com become complacent in how I style a movie. Um, not to say that, I mean, obviously it was an amazing movie, um, but like, like, I'm still learning, I'm still growing, I'm still finding my simple aesthetic. I love experimenting with something every new project. One thing that I will say remains consistent for me is that probably not something you can necessarily see by putting my movie side by side, but I like story comes first for me. And what I do is I will take the script and I'll go through and I'll map out original story pieces. So like, is this going to have camera movement? Is this going to be uh, incredibly saturated film? Is it going to be desaturated? Is it going to have a lot of like deep space or flat space? Is it going to, look more like a Coen Brothers movie versus a Scorsese movie. Like, it's just finding all those different things and making sure that I'm using all these pieces to tell the story visually. Like, you should be able to watch the movie and understand what the, like, where the very emotional telling pieces are simply by, like, visuals. I don't know... This is an aside, I guess, but I don't know if you heard of Bruce Block. Like, he was one Say it of again. Bruce Block. He's a professor okay. at USC, and he has this vision storytelling book. It, it goes into explaining a lot more like how to do things visually. And that's, that's honestly one of the biggest things that I've used to find like, in my cinematography. I also use a use a lot of natural light. Would you say when you collaborate with directors or other departments on set, you have very specific visual references that you share with people? Uh, yes. So going back to or something I said earlier, like Chinatown being one of my favorite movies, one of the things that the DP did for that movie is he like set plants out and just let them die. And, like, as they died, he took pictures, and that's the color palette of the film. So, like, Ooh. depending on what the story is about helps me figure out how I'm going to do visuals. Sometimes I'll go toward art, like, paintings. I love looking, like, and it doesn't matter what artist. Like, I love John Atkinson Grimshaw. Like, I love his style. Like, on the way he uses color. I love the way he uses light. Um, but his style isn't necessarily what's going to lend itself to every single film. You know what I sure. Mean? So, but I'm currently working on this film called Renovation. Um, and it's like a sci-fi type thing. And ironically, like, I've been working on this since last year, pre-COVID. Um, but ironically enough, it's very much like sci-fi COVID related. <laughs> Um, it's dystopia. Probably, um, like, dystopia <laughs> content's really real right now. <laughs> yeah, so like it's about how the Botox industry is destroying the world and Ooh. Like, it's destroying the air you breathe just by the creation of like false Botox. Um, so everybody in the movie, good for the actors, is wearing a mask. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but what we're doing with that is we, there's a lot of hierarchy and levels and things. So one of the things we're using is like um, sci-fi films as our reference points, like uh, Metropolis, uh, Blade Runner, stuff like that. So we're going through those and like figuring out what they did with the contrast and how they frame people in a frame. Uh, the director also comes in with a bunch of his own visuals. And then in order for me to, like we, 
we have very open dialogue about um, this is what you see, what if we do this? And he has a lot of camera movement as well. So it's like, I also love to include in my visuals actual moving pictures, not just like, mm. if I'm working with color palette, uh, painting is fine. But if I'm working with like camera movement, I need something to emulate camera movement. Like if we're gonna talk about a wanner, like I'm gonna bring up the scene from True Detective. That's awesome. Can I answer your question? Yeah, no, it totally <laughs> does. <laughs> no, it's good. I think it's important. Um, all right, I find it inspiring to kind of know how all those references come together. Because I think especially now uh, when we're consuming so much content, oh my God, uh, yes. it is such a choice. I know it's such a choice for myself to choose to be critical or choose to be very present while I'm watching versus the choice to turn off my brain and to just like let it be flat. Like I really, I've noticed a lot uh, when I watch movies now during the quarantine of how much I'm engaging or how much the camera movement really engages your focus versus how comfortable it can be when things are flat. Like there's yeah, something yeah. so like relaxing about not having to think, you know, when, why it's so important to. Yeah. Like, have you seen the conversation? I'm not sure. It's a very old movie. Like it's, uh, it has some pretty. I feel like it's honestly, its title sequence is really like, like um, pertinent and like one of the biggest visual images of the film is like it's just the tape recorder spinning, and then okay, like they use flat space a lot. A lot. That's why. Oh, I interesting. That's oh, okay. They also have camera movement in one of that. It's really good. Good movie. Yeah, I mean, I again something that I've been really mindful of is say when I used to go to a movie theater, there's something about when you pay for admission and you sit there, how much more present you are. You can't pause it. You can't get snacks halfway. You're there and you're watching. And when I've seen certain like independent films or international movies that have these really stunning like static shots, like really long, just staying there, maybe the, the cat's coming in out of screen or people are coming out of screen, but the camera's not moving. That's something that can be so visceral without movement you know, versus something like casino, you know, and everything's so fluid and you're constantly kind of going through the casino with them. Uh, it does change your perspective too when you're feeling like you're rolling with it. Um, but yeah, actually I was wondering if you can maybe talk more about how, uh, it's weird to say pre and post COVID, but that's our world now. That's our world now. But uh, in the world pre-COVID, how you would stay inspired or like reactivated with material between projects honestly like i know this is probably weird and maybe it's because i'm still pretty new in the industry but one of the ways i stay inspired is like literally still working so i like and i enjoy working below the line so i wear well i'm cinematographer below the line but like I enjoy working as a first AC because then I can see other DP still work. Like I'm all about learning more tricks. Um, fortunately, now we're in COVID, we can learn. Sorry, should I pause for the play? It's all good. <laughs> That's um, a world now. <laughs> so many fucking helicopters. I live next to a police station. Um, yeah. But what was I saying? I was saying uh, uh, I work as a first AC because. I learn all these different tricks from all these really great DPs. And it gives me ideas taking it into my next project. So, but I also enjoy the time off between one DP project and the next because, like, it gives me time to also read more books. Like, I, like I'm an avid reader. I, like how you were just saying that you have um, taken in or started noticing how much you're actually engaging in a movie versus not. Um, I don't necessarily always engage in the content that I'm watching, but a book, you have to be active in a book. There's no just like glancing through. Um, that's a TV TV show, I believe. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Um, but that gives me ideas. I love looking at pre- um, photography books like by old photographers who started the art um i feel like there's a lot to be learned from them and then 
but also I really need to figure that out. I just feel like getting out in the world and doing things. I took an internship with Disney back when I was an undergrad, and one of the best classes there, it was literally called Experiences, and it told you how to engage in your daily life, and you treat everything like an experience. Hmm. So everything you do is an experience and is shaping your future self, whether you know it or not. But like, any, I don't know, any one of the swimming pool, you never know what's going to happen with the swimming pool. Like, maybe somebody dro- dropped a fluid in the pool. You don't know how that's going to affect. Like, something mundane and stupid. Like, I don't know. But, like, I don't know, what's up there? Would you say there are certain uh, cinematographers that you can say you're, like, continually inspired by? Or, you know, like, sure, there's oh, some yeah. that you're, like, Oh, of course, that person. But are there some, I don't know, people in the range there between people that have been, like, you know, like deacons, like, we can all talk about deacons, but, like, people kind of in the yeah. milieu. Right now, so, like, I really, I know Rude Murano has really branched over into more directing the DP work, um, but I love her visual aesthetic, like, the way she uses contrast, the way she uses light, like, it's always incredibly soft but she knows how to make it look kind of hard, like, because of the way she does contrast. It's amazing. Um, but my favorite cinematographer is Kurt Van Hoeksma. He shot, like, her, one of the James Bond movies. I don't really watch the James Bond movies. He recently also shot, I mean, my favorite is Let the Right One In, which is, like, this vampire movie. Um, oh, okay. It's like, amazing. I'll have to uh, check it out. Like, I just feel like he, like, he, like, I, I like to emulate or use him as a role model in the sense of, like, when he makes a movie or shoots a movie, he definitely is telling a story through his visual style. Like, her is beautiful. And then he also recently did, which I didn't, uh, but I didn't really like it, is the, the beach movie, Dunkirk. Oh, yeah, yeah. I didn't re- I mean the beach didn't movie. Really. <laughs> um it was great, but I was just like nah this is this is I didn't it didn't empower me at all. Yeah, I mean that's I have to say it's you know that's the the challenging part of when you can be so consumed by a project and inspired by a project but what is the you might you can't control how people are going to experience it. Yeah. You know like I've watched a lot of um, like behind the scenes of that movie and it's if anything it's inspiring seeing how people can still play and experiment with um, you know where you can put cameras and how far you can push bodies and movement and all these things uh, and I, I feel like that is at least it's like a testament to like seeing how how challenged people can be uh, but um, I don't know if anything it almost feels like an art piece oh yeah you know like a and the, I think that's what's exciting about cameras and, you know, getting to work with them. Is sometimes you can really be this element to like, or this conduit to telling a story. And then sometimes you really just get to experience a story and your lens happens to be on it. You know, it's a matter of whether or not or how aware you are, how much the filmmakers are letting you be aware of how much they're there, you know? No, like, I actually also watched some behind, the, some behind the scenes, and I'm like, wouldn't they, like, the IMAX camera was so fucking huge, or the, not IMAX, but the camera was so big, that, like, yeah. the camera in the plane, like, upside down or something? Well, like, I think they did use thing. IMAX cameras, but, um, yeah, they had to do a lot of nutty things with those, those cameras, for sure, uh, so and... Huge, and then created, and then Sony came along, and, like, here's the finish, you can bring it down to, like, a small, like, dslr size camera. <laughs> Yeah, it's pretty wild. I mean, that's ex- yes. Oh, I have not worked with it yet. Did you enjoy it? Eh, I mean, it's all so cameras funny. are great. Please sponsor all of our stuff, but oh. but at the same time, I mean, um, I think you you get really you get a very specific perspective on a camera body when you're only on one project with it. You know, and I, I haven't been in a place in my career to really be like the tester. Or like I didn't do the camera or lens tests. Uh, I was sort of another cog in the wheel, very far down the line, dealing more with the 
the digital download and like the processing of all the formats and it's you have so much range but then um, sometimes you have to be very mindful of even if you have all the options you should know what your options are in the first place not like getting it because it has options like to be specific i was working on a uh, indie film that was supposed to be shooting on the uh, for airflex 416 like 16 millimeter film I used that. and i was excited because i as you know i'm newer in this career and i've mostly worked with digital cameras uh and there obviously is a resurgence of film cameras but um literally the second day of a two-day prep halfway through the day they're like just kidding it's not going to be film here's a sony venice i was like oh, why uh and then no one knew like you have all this range with these digital cameras the sensors are getting larger all, you can get all this information baked into the chip but you need to know what you want from it like as cinematographers and camera assistants like just because you have these tools you you have to be you have to know how to use them and oh, it's yeah. okay that we're all still learning how to use them. There's so many new technologies developing. That's kind of a part of it, but it just felt in that one project, it was like such a departure. And I think that they ended up getting maybe more range from the Venice, but they didn't really know what they were doing, <laughs> you know? And if anything, we were, get, we were probably getting almost like more information than they needed or realized they wanted. And then the downloads would be like crazy long because we're just getting everything like, versus I getting, love, you know, exactly what you need. I, and that honestly is kind of a problem in the world of being a DP is because like, I've worked with, there's a director I worked with consistently, love her to death. Um, and she knows it bothers me. Uh, but like, I will shoot a music, we'll shoot a music video together and I'll be like, do you li like, do you like this? This looks great, right? Because normally music videos are but like, it's like you find out three days before and then you go shoot it. Um, but like, framing up the first shot, do you like this? Like, it visually, it looks great. And I shot it 43 Kelvin. Then we get into col like coloring, and she's like, no, make it warmer, make it warmer, make it warmer. I'm like, it had like that nice, like, it was a it was an Alexa Mini, and it had that like, and I shot it with um, Life of Sweet Alexas. Oh, uh, and I shot it with just like the 40 millimeter it looked beautiful um but she wanted to fucking make it warmer and I was like why <laughs> and then and then also like and this is the time where I like officially like figured out her visual aesthetic as a director she she comes from a very much of a photography world and she loves putting people up against a flat white space and like photoing like taking their picture okay um and she likes everything to be like a half stop, a half stop to stop overexposed, like the key side. And she doesn't like much contrast. Okay. So, like, she also pushed everything up when we shot that music video. Like, I shot it exposed, but she like huh. took it up to level. Huh. Interesting. So yeah, I had that. It was fun, but like now I know, like. And I guess, and it's also like going back to the what we we're talking about. Like, because she had that information, she could do that. But if I want to protect my visual for next time, basically you shoot things at like. Well, I guess you like you still have power windows and shit. But like, who was the DP? There was a DP, like an old, like super old DP, like. I'm talking early 1900s DP. He would put a, br a really bright at this was film, really bright ass bulb in the frame, and like make sure it's overexposed or like just under, like overexposed, so that way they couldn't fuck with his image of the post. Ooh. Well, Pro tips. Yeah, like digital. I'm like. That's what we need to do. We've got fucking power windows. We just cap you. <laughs> if only. Well, speaking of collaborations, because that's clearly what our industry is about, uh, yeah. would you say there is uh, certain people or certain projects that you've had like, the longest collaborations with so far? Yeah, honestly, it's the director I was just talking about. Like, currently, she's living in Germany, but like, we are, we're still like working 
we had something lined up previous to COVID that's been pushed. But like it's just like she's been ever since I got out of grad school, she's been my longest collaboration. And then I have another gentleman that I shot my first two features with, um, that I've worked with him on multiple projects. I have I have several like directors that I work with regularly. But the thing is it's like they can be just those can make more connections. So I still like really think the plan of like working in new directors. Because you have to. Like if you don't you're not you're not Long. Yeah, I mean, it's always like the the catch, right? It's like it's exciting when you get to work with people, and then they continue to hire you, and then some people then assume that you're not available because they think that you're always getting hired, and you're like, yeah. no, but I want to work with new people. <laughs> yeah, because each director also has their own aesthetic, and like if I have just those directors, then it's just their look that's going to be on my reel. Like she, like female director she really likes that little bit overexposed look and I love her style like love it but um I can do more than that and then the guy I shot features with he has a very like he wants to shoot it like almost like it's shooting a, a stage play and the, that's fine but for me it kind of looks like sometimes it can you have to do it artfully otherwise it can look more like student film or you're not doing it purposefully mm. so that's one of the things like it, it's not stuff you necessarily that is exciting if you put it on your reel sure it come across. but like i love working with him and like he told me his content is something meaningful which is ultimately the project i choose or something that like have a deeper meaning to it other than you're like this is a high action movie cool come watch it i get that well uh i guess we we have to kind of say it while we're recording but how do you feel or what do you think our industry is going to look like post covid um i think for a while like i honestly think for a while it will be like staggered getting started up and then i think it'll be a full boom I think in the beginning, we will try to be clean, have safety precautions, like all this stuff, and there'll be like a ton of measures, but then I don't think it'll last long. Like, it's just not financially something the production companies are going to want to pay for. It's not something non-union. It'll kill the non-union plan if this is how it's going to go. Um, I just, I don't think it's something that's going to last forever like I think people will still be more like crazy about washing their hands and using hand sanitizer and all this stuff but that's not something that takes time and money like extra money um I think trying to house people in hotels for two weeks uh everybody except talent has to wear a mask like people like I'm walking around LA and I see people I'm like people are already over masks like do you think people like especially grip and electric because they're like hustling you think they're gonna want to wear a mask all day no you're gonna find them on the grip shop not wearing a mask <laughs> i know it now yeah well that's that's a part of it right is it's like the like the community aspect and a weird sense of peer pressure versus social responsibility and how you sustain that amongst your team let alone amongst your family or people on the street, it's a little tricky. But to before we like close up our interview today, I was wondering if maybe you can talk a little bit more about this this community that we're in, our filmmaking community, and maybe specifically uh, as a queer female in this industry, if you wanna maybe talk a little bit about that. Um, one thing I've noticed about the film community, especially, I guess maybe it's because I'm coming in so I don't work in the union world. I'm not union. Um, I'm, I, ha I have the days to join. I haven't had the, I don't feel like my network is there yet to join. Um, but that being said, the community I work in, I work in mostly indie. And I feel like if I'm, if I'm the person hiring my crew, it's always the first. I'm not hiring based on race or gender or anything like that. But, like, if it's a script that 
leans more towards like something like a hot topic of rape or race i feel like i it's my due diligence here to like putting those types of voices on my set like is group so like if it's say rape like i try to be sensitive to knowing who i'm gonna have who my keys are for on set for that project so like i want more females on that group um not to say men can't handle it but like normally like you you need a female on set like just to be there so like i think it's important to have that and then uh that i know this is an aside but like i also it's the best man for the job or woman and that being said i have a gaffer that i use consistently but he isn't always necessarily the gaffer i need for a job because his he has a very distinct lighting style and then i don't want to hire his lighting style to light a movie that needs more like art like colorful artistry or lighting because he's very naturalistic kind of guy like daylight like that is his skill like his strength um but as lgbt even coming up as an ac i found that like when you have the director or the dp or lgbt like normally they hire lgbt so like it's like it's like and it's, it's the same with women it's women hire women so if you have a whoever your department side heads are they typically hire their females it's, and i honestly so i worked one day on goliath as a as a camera pa and this day was like one of the last of the season and there are 13 people in camera crew that's like there's three cameras their acs the dp i was the only woman i was like yeah this is what's wrong with hollywood <laughs> i see it yeah and i'm just like why aren't there more women on set like they're like and something I've found that is really hard to like digest is it's really hard to find grip on like a female. Like I I think they're starting to come into it, but like there aren't many. So I like to put especially in, in like introductory positions, like if some like if there's like I have an extra spot to fill and I know of a female that wants to get into the directorate, I'm like or I'm just like yes, come be on my set. Because I want to be the person who pushes you to be that one female that everybody calls on to be gripping like it. Because we need that. Like, we need more visibility in that, those two departments. Totally. Sorry, I'm, I'm also in New York City and there's a lot of noise here. <laughs> if anyone can't tell, um, our, our city is going through a lot right now, like all the cities in the world are. But it is a, it is a matter of visibility and I, I've definitely experienced that here in New York as well. Uh, and it's kind of always exciting when you see just more diverse faces on set and not just like, oh, I'm hiring just because you're this or I'm hiring just because of that. But seeing people that are qualified and are working really hard, you know, and it's pretty cool because like uh, I, I think the project that was on maybe in February, there was a um, female POC best boy and it was awesome, you know, and it's like, everyone was still getting their job done. It wasn't like anyone had like a token badge, like look at me as an ally. It was just like, look at this person's qualified. They're killing it. You know, and it's like, why aren't there more people like that? I don't know. It's, it's a work in progress. I feel you're right. It is a work in progress. Yeah. I feel like because I've come up and you have come up at the time of like when we're basically starting this revolution of like having more women in film below the line and above it. Yeah. Um, I think I see, that's why I see so many more on the sets that, like, whoever the department head is, like, if they're a woman, they're hiring them. Like, I can't tell you how many of the producers are like, yes, I love hiring females in the camera department. They save my contact simply because I'm female. Like, yeah. Which, I mean, let me prove that I'm good first, but, like, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, it's a, a tricky balance. I know I that's something that I definitely want to, like that's my agenda that I'm pushing forward and I'm unashamed of it, but 
hopefully we'll get to a point where it's, you know, you don't say uh, doctors and female doctors, you just kind of say doctors or yeah. firefighters or female fight, you just say firefighter, you know? So it's like, there's a lot of cinematographers out there, POC cinematographers, queer cinematographers, women cinematographers, but ultimately it's really exciting when you just see someone listed and they're just a cinematographer. It's not another female DP, you know? It might be in Rachel Morrison or Reed Milano, I forget which one, but they were like, I don't technic technically like support the term like female cinematographer or woman DP because like what you just said, like I'm a DP, like I'm a cinematographer. Why do we have to gender it? You don't say a male, that's a male cinematographer. Yeah, <laughs> if only. Maybe if we started doing that more, it would that's come out like, <laughs> yeah, really? Cinematographer. <laughs> that's cool well i just want to say thank you so much for your time and i'm excited to see more of your work out there we're going to like clearly like link your imdb or your website or wherever so more people get to know you uh and yeah thanks for your time today. thank you so much thank you for having me of I course hope i have given some coherent answers <laughs> <laughs> i think so too <laughs> i'll see you soon